All right, um, so we're going to shift gears just a little bit in some ways. Um, rather than talk specifically and in a lot of detail of the research I'm doing, I thought maybe I'd talk more about some of the learning, some of the higher level concepts and the implications of those things on all of these things. Uh, far a little less on financing, but I think it has direct implications on financing uh, and billing. And you may or, or not agree with everything that I say, and I think that's fine, so I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. So why don't we get started? So I'm going to start, let me, let me just say, that the, to, as a reference point, even though I'm trained as a physician, my reference point is largely working in uh, low income, Af you can't hear me? Is this on? Lo working in low income African American inner city populations, uh, primarily, but not only, and increasingly working on the patient side of things more so than on the clinician and healthcare system side. And with that lens, it says that by far and away, the bulk and the majority of all the care that is needed for an individual to be healthy is provided by non-professional uh, healthcare practitioners. And it's provided in non-clinical settings. It's just a fundamental reality. Because if we believe that those of us with MDs, PhDs, and everything else are the crux of the matter, and where we do it is what matters, then I think we've lost the game even before it starts. And I'll try to illustrate some of that in, in my talk today. So with regard to disparities, I didn't spend a lot, I just had the assumption that you understand what they are and, and they're here. Um, that may or may not be the case. If you want me to talk in depth, I could talk for six weeks on just disparities. But they're, they're real, let me say in general, they're population level differences in health status or health outcomes um, that um, are not, as, well, they're attributable to a lot of things. Most people attribute them to, to socioeconomic status, uh, race, ethnicity. But let me say, those things taken aside, all things created equal, they still exist. So at the highest income strata level across the board, African Americans and minority groups as a group tend to do poorer with the same, uh, with same level of care for the same uh, indications for care than, than whites do. So this is not purely and only a socioeconomic problem, although within that strata the problems are far worse. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Um, so they exist across all income levels, all clinical settings, all types of providers, all types of, uh, of, 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 of health problems and issues, and some have made the distinction between health care disparities and health disparities, health care being uh, somehow related to those things in which the healthcare system has some opportunity to affect and health uh, disparities being health status with the notion that health status is determined by things beyond the healthcare system. From my perspective, again, hopefully you'll see today that that distinction is really useless um, because quite frankly, many of the things that drive the clinical things that we concern ourselves with in the clinical setting happen outside and people can't be totally healthy without the interaction of a, of a healthcare uh, institutions. So increasingly we have to be able, if we're going to have a comprehensive and informed understanding of these things, uh, to put these things together. And finally, I could be talking about any disease. The reality is when I was in medical school, like maybe some of you in nursing and medical school, we were trained that you know medicine and health, or cancer in particular, is a genetic disease. I remember that. Absolutely not true. I mean, there's a gen genetic component to it, absolutely right. But it's far overblown, I think, in our thinking of why things happen. Even the nuts and two-hit hypothesis, what does it say? You have the genetic hit, but then you need that environmental hit. We even way back then, we acknowledged it, but we didn't really, really understand it. All right. So, and, and, and finally, this is not just a U.S. thing. This is happening all over the world. Europe has been way out in front of us in terms of looking at disparities. They call them uh, inequalities and more so inequities now, and we're, we're moving in that direction. But this is a global phenomenon. It's not just here. Um, and there's been no systematic, sustained national improvement, period. A actually, anywhere in the world. Um, in this country, we now have almost 10 years worth of national level data in the National Health Care Quality Report and the National Health Care Disparities Report. And, and the National Health Care Quality Report tells us what? What's happening to the quality of health care in this country over the, over the last decade since we've been measuring it? Anybody know? Has it been improving, getting worse? Patty says getting worse. Everybody agree? It's been the same. About the same? 
Well, it says healthcare is improving, but just a little bit, just a little bit. It's not much at all. But what does the National Healthcare Disparities Report show us? Same thing, getting better, getting worse, about the same. Well, it actually says there's no systematic change at all. Some things get better in some years, then they get worse the next year. Some things getting worse, and some things getting worse over time. So there's been no improvement at all. And this is also true in Europe and other places where, where we've looked at this thing. But um, in some areas, like cardiovascular disease, well, there's huge improvements. In what you have are huge people getting better at things. The differences, the gap between and, and even sometimes those gaps narrowing. But over time, over the last 10 years, I'm not aware of any area where the gap has was wider 10 years ago, is narrow now, and stays that way. You know, there, there's this, this going on. So what is it attributable to? Is it attributable to secular trends, to things we're doing, to other things, and why hasn't it been staying in that direction? Now, I, I could be wrong if I don't know the data or, or I'm, I'm forgetting something. There are small areas, there are small studies and moderately sized studies showing if you do X, you can improve this. Scale it up to a national level, nothing. Yeah. Uh, you say death? Death. I mean, the CDC, we're, we're gaining like a half a year of life per year in, in these, in these tables. For so everybody. Right. stop in half the death rate in the last 20 years. And right. AIDS has dropped in like 80%. Of the two cancers have gotten better. No, right. And I think that, you know, I think that it may have widened the disparity in some cases. Right. Both exactly. Exactly. That's the point I'm making. We are, things are getting better categorically for diseases. The disparities, the differences between the reference population and the population you're talking about have not always gotten in better, and in some cases they've actually widened. That's the key. We're not just talking about a rising tide lifting all boats equally. We're talking about closing gaps, and that's not what has changed. That has not changed. Um, and then given the demographics of our country, like around the world, we got to figure this out because this has huge cost implications and huge manpower implications, huge workforce implications, huge health implications, and things that are going to get worse. If you just look at the, the things, we have a huge increase in the number of seniors that are coming down this population. Just a few years, one out of every three persons living in this country is going to be over the age of 65. Twenty percent of the population is going to be over the age of 85. We have a rough time handling one chronic disease in a patient. Seniors are, have up to five chronic diseases. It's going to be a huge, huge problem. Two, we have um, the cost. We've already talked about rising costs. We have huge numbers of uh, surging numbers of uh, immigrants and minorities. And again, those populations are not handled well. It's, it's easier for some to see, oh, Hispanics, different language talking. But the same problems exist oftentimes with African American populations. And uh, in three states already in this country are majority minority. Soon it'll be almost half the states, like it or not. This is the reality of the demographics. If we can't, and uh, if we don't handle the, how we provide care uh, to these populations well now, think what's going to happen when the numbers uh, absolutely balloon in just a few years. Um, current interventional models simply aren't working. I don't care what angle you come from, a clinical model, a, a social determinants model, a health equity model, uh, I mean, we could talk about it, but none of them are working at, at, a, at a national level. Small studies, yes. Improvements here, self-limited improvements, yes. Um, and so where this comes to where we're talking about, the digital divide is real, uh, but perhaps not what you think. And I think there, there are some real opportunities here. So the bottom line to all of this is that disease causation in general, I could be talking about any disease, but health disparity is a little easier for people to see. In particular, result from complex interactions of many factors, not just race, discrimination, whatever you want, not just genetics, not just anything, of many factors that simultaneously act together, often cooperatively act together in a dynamic system that changes over time. It's not the same today as it was, it will be in two years as it was when you were a teenager. And it's in this construct that we have to try to understand health and disease, as well as decisions that are made about that, but also about healthcare dis disparities, which adds on another level. But coming here, the reality is, in terms of patient empowerment, what we've learned is that comprehensively understanding patient empowerment and what you mean by that and how you do it and what people think about it, particularly among racial and ethnic minorities, you cannot do it uh, by focusing only on what happens in the clinical encounter. You just, you just can't. 
Um, and I'll come back to this again to illustrate why. Um, and this poses certain challenges, but again, I think it also poses certain opportunities, which I'll, which I'll come, come back to again. Um, a reality, uh, Dr. About, some of you uh, know him. I know for, he's on the faculty of Georgia Tech, distinguished professor of School of Interactive Community. Just a few weeks ago at AMIA uh, said this. I think he's absolutely right. In, in five years or less, the majority of clinical data, data will be collected from outside the clinical setting. And that's not even coming at it from the way I was just coming, coming at it, from looking at all types of, of other sort of social and, and cultural and other, other things. With all the sensing, we talked about participatory sensing last night and all these things coming on, the majority of the clinically relevant data that, that uh, uh, healthcare individuals will be exposed to and have at their access will come outside of the clinical setting. I think that's absolutely right. And, and to that extent, it's going to be, it's not going to be just the EMR. It's going to be the EMR and so much more. And so the, a, a narrow and tight focus on just the EMR, I think, is also sort of missing the boat. But I know these are not easy or simple things, but these are what I see as certain realities. Um, so this is the basis, and I'm not going to spend time here on this notion of populomics that we have been talking about over the years, essentially a fusion of population sciences, medicine, and informatics, um, emerging discipline focus on population level, transdisciplinary integrated disease risk characterization, interdiction, and mitigation that relies heavily on innovations in computer and information technologies. Um, we can talk more about it later, but at any rate, we, we, we feel that looking at things this way, this is, this is really, really, it's, 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 uh, it's more realistic. Quite frankly, we study things in test tubes, we, we find molecular pathways, but in reality, nobody is just a test tube, right? But at the same time, we, whether you're a social scientist, we study, study social networks, or you study uh, behaviorism, you study discrimination, whatever, but nobody is just that either. We are also, so the idea is you have to put all these things together to really comprehensively understand, and all of these things exist at as, as systems. And so we're talking about understanding how systems at multiple levels interact across those levels and between those levels in order to, 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 to uh, affect health outcomes. Hard, but the reality. But, but by looking at things this way, we are thinking we can come up and looking at things that we just simply can't do now. We, we, we're talking, we're developing this concept of socio-behavioral phenotyping. Um, that if you, rather than starting with an individual, if you look at across a population of patients or people of any kind, it could be cardiovascular disease, MI, could be African Americans, cut it any way you want to, seniors, you know, right now, you know, we try to, to, to do these studies to define what's the molecular pathway of the disease they got and, and then go to the community to see once we spend millions of dollars doing that, then take that to the population and do uh, genome-wide association studies to find out how many people in the population have it. After we spend billions of dollars, we get these depressing results of 1% of the population. And what we're saying is here, because disease causation really is a multiple of things, if we examine a population of patients and looking across these symptoms, we may be able to pick out uh, five, 10, six, eight, uh, you know, 20 things that seem to segregate together within a huge, you know, 30%, 40%, 80% of all the patients who have that particular thing and define uh, a socio-behavioral phenotype, which we then can link to the underlying molecular genetics and create a causal profile, which would be far more, we think, uh, uh, productive than, than the way it's done now. And that's the basis of what we're calling Fiji analysis, Fiji, phenotypic, genotypic analysis rather than genotypic, phenotypic, the way it's done now. And then you can get into sort of looking at populations ahead of time to say, well, we see these things. We know in this population it's led to a disparity or a disease or whatever. Uh, can we predict in a population which populations are going to be at, at higher risk uh, for developing a certain outcome, be it a disparity or anything else? better than just using the, the indicators we have now of race, ethnicity, or, or, or mutations of some form or, form or fashion. And then finally, can we prevent the harm even if we can't uh, prevent the, the causative agents or set of agents? So getting back to the technology, the other end of, so the one side of technology and, and, and if it's helping us understand the pathogenesis of disparities in a much more comprehensive and I think realistic way. The other side is wh where most people are thinking uh, in healthcare now, these types of things, EMR, CPOE systems, all in, 
all of these things within the context of an ACO or a patient-centered medical home. Um, but from my perspective, this is just the tip of the tip of the iceberg. What do all these things have in common? Hmm? Data is one thing, yeah. Anything else? They're all prescribed by the, the healthcare system. Absolutely. They're all for practitioners, for healthcare systems, for hospitals, for doctors and nurses. And don't get me wrong, I think if we were able to do these things in the way people talk, all hospitals connected, all doctors connected, all nurses, whoever's in the system with each other, data flowing seamlessly, interoperability everywhere, uh, that would be an amazing thing that would likely uh, and associated with changes in practice patterns. Because if we don't change anything, uh, what, I, what I tell my medical students, if all we do is have an electronic version of the paper record, we'll get the same results we have been getting, only faster. Um, so associated with changes, that would be an amazing thing. But another reality we're forgetting. Um, the healthcare system, the core of our healthcare system now, the core, not the whole entirety, just the core, um, and some of you have heard me say this, doctors, hospitals, and healthcare, and hos doctors, nurses, and hospitals and clinics. We have about 700,000 docs in this country, 2.6 million nurses, and 5,200 hospitals and health clinics. If all of them were connected, that would be a phenomenal thing and great. But as we're moving forward in, away from a fee-for-service uh, model of healthcare into you know, value-based purchasing based on outcomes, the, this healthcare system is increasingly responsible for the health of patients. And as of the last census, we're talking about 308 million patients, okay? So I think when you think about it from that perspective, it's not possible for 308 million patients to interact with the healthcare system when they need it at the times and in the ways they need it all the time without technology. It's just a challenge for me to understand how that's gonna be possible. Um, we can make it, they interact on our schedules, but that's not where patients are. And then finally, how does this really, really come home other than sort of conceptually? You know, we're all going through, you know, electronic medical records and meaningful use and, and meaningful use being rolled out in three stages. Stage one just, just happened, started last year, the beginning of this year. Stage three though, not, not even, uh, scheduled to come on board until 2015 and it may get pushed back, not even really defined what it is. But if you look at the legislation that's out there now, the sort of umbrella legislation, it has some language in there that I think most providers especially haven't even recognized or grappled with at all. That is very significant. It, in that stage, um, and it hasn't been totally defined what it is, but, this, but the legislation is, is interesting. It says, in that time when we're in stage three, so beyond 2015, so we're not talking 10 or 15 years down the road, for a provider to get full reimbursement for what they do with patients, they not only have to have these systems and use them, but the systems that they use have to have, quote, um, advanced electronic tools for special populations of patients. So integrated within those, the EMRs that you have, they have to have patient-specific tools for them. And in my estimate, this reading it, we're not talking about a simple patient portal here where you can schedule a, an office visit or see your labs. As, as I think about it, if you think about most patients, if all we're talking about is letting them see their labs, hemoglobin A1Cs and whatever, after the third time of looking, about, looking at that, they're gonna stop for the overwhelming majority of them. Those are things that matter to us and to a few patients, but the overwhelming majority of people, oh, I gotta see my A1C today, what is it today? They're, they're not there, but they are somewhere. <laughs> and that's the problem we have, that we are in a different place assuming that patients want and need what we think they want and need, and we're right sometimes, but I think we're ghastly wrong sometimes. And so this is where it comes together, and if we don't have tools that meet patients' needs integrated within the tools that we need, it's gonna affect our bottom line in ways that we're not even thinking about. So for us, consumer health informatics, this is a definition that we developed on a project for, for HRQ, building actually on Patty's um, definition out of the, uh, the project health design uh, work that she's done that HRQ has now ad adopted. So bottom line, we're saying here, consumer health informatics tools involve any type of technology, not just so-called EMRs or PHRs that they have been traditionally defined, but any technology that uses personal information and gives personalized feedback um, with or without the interaction of 
uh, a provider or healthcare professional, that's to distinguish it from medical informatics tools, which are considered part of the of the of of, of, of routine care. Well, it's it on one level that's not technology, right? Yeah. So paper is not electronic, but I understand where you're going. Um, so and it gives back individual individualized feedback to distinguish it from, say, um, a tool maybe on um, the. Uh, National Library of Medicine that you can go and find out anything about breast cancer for all women in the world. It's specifically about you and your case that helps you both manage your health and health care. Uh, and we can talk more about that. So why should we not, as the healthcare system, ignore these trends? This is documented, Manhattan Research last year. For the first time in history, more Americans are turning to electronic and online sources for health information and support. The other thing is not just about health information. It's not just about data. It's about support. Then they are turning to their providers. First time in history. Already happening. They want to get to their providers more, but they can't for a whole variety of reasons. This is not just minority patients. First time in history. And the Pew data is saying that one third of people who use these online resources say they have been positively helped. So they're not dying. And there is no studies that show any significant degree of harm that, ha that can be attributable to the information uh, that patients are getting on the internet. I'm not saying there's not bad information out there. I'm saying we don't have a whole lot of information that shows that patients have been harmed by using what's out there. And in fact, we, we know that patients are much more savvy than we believe them to be. They're not just going to the first place and using whatever they, whatever they do. We can talk more about that later. Um, there's emerging evidence that suggests the value of consumer health informatics. Some of you have done that. We've done uh, one of the first systematic reviews of the literature. And, they, and patients cite three main reasons why, why they're going in this direction. One is the convenience, and these are three things our healthcare system does very poorly at. The convenience. They don't have to take off from their job, from jobs that don't, you know, don't pay you if you don't come to work. They can do it at 2 in the morning if they need it. They can do it at 3 in the afternoon. Um, healthcare system, you come when the office is open, um, except for the emergency room. The cost. If you've got the, you know, the, the service that hooks you up to the internet, you basically got it. And they believe erroneously but they do believe that there's some anonymity there. So that they will say things and ask questions uh, through online resources that, that, that they don't say or tell us. And the truth is many patients, particularly minority patients, are not always telling you what they believe and what they know, but they're telling you what they, want, they think you want to hear. And that's why you have problems with so-called compliance, adherence, and we'll talk just a quick bit about that before. But they don't do that as much with online resources because of this fallacious belief that there's some anonymity there. But again, I think that presents some opportunities. Okay, just a, a slide on digital disparities. So you know this term, the digital divide, originally came when the Secretary of Commerce back in 1999 uh, noted that we're, you know, in the National Telecommunications and Information Survey that they do every year found that um, there's a difference between the so-called haves and the have-nots. The haves, those with higher incomes, were getting uh, internet connectivity more so than others, really focused on computer ownership in the, in the early days, that's what they were measuring, and then they moved into broadband access and they saw they weren't getting it, and they felt that this would impede the ability of the systems to benefit those have-nots. Um, but, but a lot has happened. Early on we focused on getting you know, minorities and low-income communities computers or finding out if they have that. And we now know their distinct user profiles. Certain people use in a certain way. You can define it geographically, you can define it by race, ethnicity, by age, or a hundred other different ways. But everybody doesn't use the same. And this is, I think, important because when we're thinking about tools for patients, assuming that just because you have a good tool it will be used the same way by all people and therefore if a certain amount of use is considered a dose and you need a certain dose to get a certain outcome, health effect, that everybody will get the same dose and therefore the same out outcome, I think is really uh, your mis a misunderstanding. Um, and so we know that that's not the case. We already have data that shows that. And it's particularly true by race, ethnicity, but other words. And then finally, now we're, we're in an age where, you know, the issue is not even whether you have a computer or not. The problem with many of the 
the surveys that are out there, they're asking, do you own a, a desktop computer in your home or do you have broadband access? And when they say no, more often in low income and minority communities, um, they say, well, you know, there's a divide. Well, in fact, with, you know, phones, gaming devices and TV, what you find is you may not, they may not own a desktop computer nor have a broadband connection to their house, but that does not in any way mean they're not getting online. And in fact, the data is out there showing that, especially with phones and social media, minority groups are using them far more, uh, blacks, Hispanics uh, especially, than uh, whites. We'll see if that continues, but, but at least it suggests there's an opportunity uh, to reach the so-called hard to reach, if we have effective tools that can be administered and, and, and do, uh, do things in this way. And then finally, we've moved away from Web 1.0 into Web 2 and even some talking about Web 3.0 where the distinction is just looking at passive material and greater and greater levels of interactivity um, and, and user generated content, which seems to be a powerful force in getting people to do things. And I think this is a bit of learning that really really needs to come into healthcare. We talk about building these tools and they're largely these passive tools show you your, 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 your lab data, show this, and they don't focus on the interactivity and that's why the uptake is so poor with traditional PHRs, for example, that are out there. They're boring. Why would anybody use them, right? But we have other examples of tools that, that a lot of people are using. So is there a role for social media along these lines? Well, as I alluded to, minorities are using social media far more than non-minorities. I can show you the data. I didn't bring it. Um, uh, minority patients, and this comes back to this empowerment and what we mean by it in the focus. Minority patients in particular stress the value of being able to tell their story and be heard. I'm told that the average, the national average for a, a consultation with a patient now is down to seven and a half minutes. I haven't actually found the documentation of that. I've seen it down to 13 minutes, but I've heard it's seven and a half minutes. But it's the same. Within the context of seven and a half or 13 minutes, there's not a whole bunch of being heard that's going to happen. And particularly among minority patients, this may well be a problem for any notion you might have of whether they're emp empowered uh, at all. And in addition to that, they also emphasize the importance of information sharing rather than just decision-making sharing. So within minority populations, it means very little if you come to the point to say, okay, you have this treatment or that treatment option, I'm not gonna tell you, let's decide together. That means very little if you had, have not had time before that discussing things along the way that mean something to both the patients and to you in the course of their care. How in the world are we gonna fit all that into a seven and a half minute or a 13 minute session is a challenge, but by looking at some of these tools, particularly social media, that offer the opportunity to do that and incorporating them, bringing them into our healthcare system, we may well have opportunities for, for uh, enabling patients to tell their stories and for us to interact with them in ways outside of a clinical setting per se that allows us to bridge this gap that's a, that's a source of very real sorts of problems within this, uh, within this uh, group. Um, and finally, they often believe that there is an acceptable role for non-adherence, acceptable non-adherence as a mechanism to express control and act on treatment preferences when real or perceived inequitable experiences exist. I've had patients tell me this, you know, I'm a, I'm a uh, uh, let's say, uh, 45-year-old African-American uh, hypertensive. Uh, I've had some problems with the system in the past, and now I, I'm been clean. I've been out. I'm t I got a family. I'm trying to take care of them, but you know, I can't get a job because they have this back here, and all this sort of everything is against me. And the doctor, and I walk in, and the doctor's discriminating against me. We can talk about that later. But then he says, so when he tells me or she tells me to take this medicine, I know it's hurting me not to take it, but it's the only thing I have control over. Like it or not, it's the reality. And until we can deal with some of that, we'll be missing. Yeah. Like sure. Of your yes. I mean, because it seemed to me like my orthopedic surgeon told me I could have surgery, and I said no. Is that non adherence? Well, yeah. it, in some books. it is in yeah, some books. It, what's that? You talk about adherence to shared goals. 
Well, actually, in this context, I was actually using it in the old way, it, uh, and I intentionally use inheritance instead of compliance, which is the word we normally use, which, as somebody else brought out earlier, I was actually folk. That's the direction we need to go. I was using it here in the sense of, you know, sticking to or doing what has been prescribed. I wasn't really focusing on had we decide together what we should do. Um, but I think that's critical. What has been prescribed versus what has been agreed to? What is actually, or really what, and even what is being done. Because again, the notion, what I'm trying to bring out here, people, patients may tell you in the office, yeah, I'm gonna do that, and walk out and do something totally different. You know, just because you're the doctor doesn't mean they're going to tell you what is really on their heart, particularly among these populations. That's why I say understanding what happens in that encounter in the context of what's happening outside is critically important if you're going to really understand what happens in that encounter. And until we have systems that can allow us to bring data in to understand that, we won't really understand when we see patients going in what we think are crazy directions. But if you understand it within the broader concept, okay, I may not like it. It still may be crazy, but I can understand why you're doing it. What can we do to fix that? Yeah. I just can tell Bill, if he, he's not non-adherent, we would have just labeled you a difficult patient. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Everyone would see it, and yeah. then that bias would be perpetuated. So take the extremes. I watched a football game. There was an advertisement of a Ford pickup truck, and I don't go out and buy one. Right. So I'm not adhering to the ad recommendation. You don't say no to your surgeon anyway. Right, right, right. Watch it. Watch it now. Watch it. Former fine, surgeon here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. I question of what adherence means in the context of patient empowerment. Absolutely. Even what empowerment means. I've had pastors in the local church, we do a lot of community-based work, the pastor comes in and says, you can't empower me. We decide when we are empowered. You're just part of the process. So this notion that you think you're doing something by providing us information that will therefore empower us, that is insulting. So I'm, I'm just trying to sort of talk at a higher level to, to help us all realize there are broader things that we need to think about to affect those very narrow things that we all concerned with and, are, and may think are the most important things. And it re directly relates to financing and other things. Um, so let me finish up here. So what, what is the future of patient empowerment in terms of the sort of intervention side? So, um, you know, I could talk about a million things. I'll just give you a couple of examples. So RFID technology, all of you, everybody knows what that is, right? the technology cell phone. So this is, I sort of stole this from Patty. It's a little different. Uh, Patty had this amazing idea years ago about the plate. Patty, you remember yeah, that the one? The yeah. plate, I've always loved it. You know, you had a, a plate and it had uh, technology in it that could tell you how many calories or whatever you put in there and that would help patients. But you know, this one is similar in that, it, and actually people are working on this right now. Let's assume for a moment that all the packaging and labeling in the grocery store had RFID tags associated. And people are working on that right now to put in bottle caps and everything. Why are they working on it? Because it can re revolutionize inventory for, for an inventory and just-in-time purchasing and, and all that kind of stuff. But let's assume we're there now, and now patients have, you know, a cell phone or some app or something that can read these things. And you have a diabetic patient she's obese, a mother, 50 year old, she's got three kids, you tell her, you know, you want her to have an 1800 uh, calorie 88 diet every day. And she comes home, she doesn't want to think about that. She's, I mean, she's tired, you know? Well, now she takes out, you know, the, the, the app and punches in 1800 calories. Let's say, oh, I feel like Chinese tonight, Chinese, and presses the button. And in two seconds, it reads what's in her closets and in her refrigerators and gives her three recipes she can cook in under 15 minutes with what she already has. And, and those are the kinds of, of consumer electronic tools that help patients that don't directly involve clinicians but are powerful for patients. I'm not trying to get rid of clinicians, but I'm saying that's not the whole game. And in fact, if we're talking about 308 million people versus 700 clinicians, these tools are going to have much more p impact over the population of patients because they're in, potentially, in everyone's home, those kinds of things. Um, by the way, I give a lot of talks like this. That's the only example that I ever give, that especially when I'm talking to patient groups, I get a standing ovation. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, PHRs. 
personal health records. You know, a lot of people have been talking about them and pushing them. The uptake has been very slim. And if you know anything about us, because most of them, at least in my estimates, are pretty boring, pretty dull. And they require user entry, manual entry for everything. And how many of us want to do that? But if you think about this in a broader way, maybe some of the tools that are coming out of Patty's work, again, with Project Health Design, or some other things that are out there that we don't even consider PHRs, but really are. Patients like me cure together. How many of you ever heard of those two things? Those are essentially PHRs. And, and again, it may be a specialized group of people that are using them, but people are rapidly using them. And I think we can learn a lot about how to design PHRs by looking at those things. And Second Life, familiar with Second Life? Second Life is an amazing thing. I don't even know what to call it. It's just an amazing thing. It's not a true PHR, but in many ways now clinicians, I, I write a blog about this kind of stuff, and I, I blogged about this a year ago or so, and I'm getting back responses from clinicians all over the world. It's like, oh yeah, I use Second Life to provide clinical treatment, usually counseling in, the, in social, in, you know, counseling. But, but my point is a lot of people are using this and, and I heard that the, the guys who developed this give a talk, they're saying, you know, to the tune of a quarter million people a month signing up to using this and paying real cash dollars to, to, to be able to do this. So a huge amount of people around the world are using this. We need to think about these things as the ways, as at least learning from them as the ways about how we reach patients wherever they are. Some of these things are in industry mediated. Um, you, you all probably have heard of, you know, the, this gaming technology out there, Nike and the iPod. So some of these Nike shoes connect directly to your iPod. That's not the, the, the innovation. The innovation is that they have 800,000 people in an interactive online environment now competing with each other to exercise. And we can't get our three patients in our populations to do it. Um, so these, Groupon, last example. How many of you know about Groupon? Now it sends out all these emails, about 11 million emails a day. You may like it or dislike it, but Groupon has proven effective at moving people to do things. And usually in the context of buying something here and there. Do you know that 15% of the, of the offers offered on Groupon now are healthcare services? 15% of that are offered are health care services. Health and wellness, right? So that includes yoga and things like It that. does include those, but it also includes uh, ophthalmology visits and eye exams and some of the, some of the things that really are health care visits. And in fact, we did, we did a piece on this for, for, for CNN. There's a group in Baltimore, the Cat's Eye Group, a, a private, not a Hopkins affiliate, a private group that experimented with this offer. They used to offer comprehensive eye exams or their, their going price was $275. They offered an incentive through Groupon for the same comprehensive eye exam. I think it was for $70 or $60. They said within seconds they sold out the whole thing. And patients, they, they said at that rate, we need patients to keep coming back. The majority of patients are coming back. And as it was so successful, they're looking for other products they can offer through Groupon. But here's the catcher, and here's where it relates to disparities. He said, who do you think are preferentially being helped by this? The haves? You might think that. They say, oh, this is a have thing to use Groupon. In fact, it's the uninsured and the minimally insured. He said the people who have great insurance or a lot of money, they didn't really care. They paid the 275. But it's the people who couldn't get in there at 275 are now coming in there at 75. So now for the first time in my life, I see a situation where we have an alignment of medical practice of market forces for the benefit of disparities populations. Exactly one, not only but one of the directions and ways we, th we need to be thinking in the future, I think, to overcome these problems. It's not going to be a one-size-fit-all. And finally, interactive TV. You know, right now, TV is not just a passive thing anymore. Um, we need to be thinking about the opportunities to engage patients, engage them, not just have them watch programs uh, through TV. This is where you can reach the poorest of the poor. They have at least three TVs in every house. You know, and so these are these are opportunities here where we don't have to buy a, another device or even have a broadband uh, hookup and eventually move into what some are calling on demand health care. Let you know on that one, you know, United Healthcare already rolled out last year and another group, I think it's Blue Cross in New York. If you have a, a computer with a webcam, whether you have insurance or not, forty five dollars, you got a 15 minute consult with a doc. It's already out there already happening, no matter where you are, no matter what time of day, no matter what's going on. 
like it or dislike it, it is the future. The future is now. I'm not talking about 10 years down the road. And these things have potential. While they benefit everybody, I think they have even more potential benefit for disparities populations because those are the populations that find it hardest to work through the system that we currently have. So these fundamental questions that Misha was talking about are maybe domains because these are not really questions. These are just some. I mean, maybe there are many others. Data integration, I mean, how do we really do that? How do we put together, you know, clinical data with, with uh, the data about discrimination and, 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 and patient activation with genetic data in, in, in any sense at all to use it in any kind of format? And how do we, it's going to be reams of data. You're talking about, you know, uh, 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 you know, pervasive computing and all these things. It's not going to be one data point. It's going to be millions. How do you turn it into actionable knowledge, not just for providers, but for patients and for caregivers? who do the bulk of the care giving anyway because they're clamoring for this if you think they're not use the internet as a proxy every time I look at this the numbers go up last time it was somewhere 180 million people looking for health uh, things now the number one search on Google as a topic it used to be pornography it's now uh, health and healthcare. what kinds of things do you think they're searching for pain you mean pain management or Disease things, that's what we as providers often think. But you know what the reality is? It's really lifestyle issues. How do I manage my stress? How do I manage all these multiple appointments? The very things that the healthcare system does so poorly. We just tell them, you gotta be here, 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 and here in all these times. And so the point is, it's not as though we have to get patients to do this, these things, work through technology. They're already doing it. But it, and we're two ships passing in the night. Unless we come together, they're going to leave us behind, and healthcare will be relegated to an institute of technical uh, technicians that they go to when they see it's necessary, when they break a leg, and not really being the comprehensive health engines that we could be uh, as we go forward. Decision support for patients, how do we do that? What does that look like? Integration and coordination of clinical, social, and educational services through technology and through our system. This gets to the, the coaches. There's a lot of information there about coaches and why they work and how they work. Um, but how do you coordinate that within the healthcare system that we have and pay for it? The impact of culture and environmental factors on everything from technology design itself, usability, outcomes, and so many other things, and enhancing this bi-directional information sharing uh, as a determinant of effective shared decision making. I think crowdsourcing has some potential opportunities here that, that could be very, very significant. So um, over time, I think there's real potential to make significant impact towards the goal of reducing and eliminating disparities over the inf entire what I call health and care continuum, not just providers in clinical settings. Um, uh, that's if we as a, as, a, as, a, as a system embrace the potential of technology beyond EMRs um, and, and the traditional things to meet patients where they are to bring them where they need to be. Thank you.